Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Pierce, and I am the executive director of Lift 360. That's the newly merged Institute of Civic Leadership, or for Civic Leadership, and Common Good Ventures. And we are delighted for the last couple of years to be a partner with Portland Public Library as they launch these kinds of conversations with you as audience members and other kinds of talks as well to engage people around what's happening in our community, but to do that in a way that's all about how do we do that civilly? How do we come to these conversations that are tough and deep and meaningful and have them in ways where we all learn from them and don't walk away angry? And I heard you, you all modeled it again last night with the, uh, with the session that was in here. That was not ours. That was that. Yeah, well, you posted it. So the library has become a center for tough conversations. <laughs> and our role has really been to help facilitate the process and working with this excellent crew that we have here at the library. I mean, we've had a chance to work with folks as facilitators and engage them in, what, in all of these conversations. So we're really happy to be doing that with you. Today we're going to focus on getting a little bit of information and hearing from some great folks. I'm Amanda Rector, um, who will be speaking in just a few moments, and you'll hear more about her, and Lisa Sakabase, who will share some stories from our communities. You'll hear more about her as well. Um, so today we will hear a bit from Kim as well. Uh, we'll talk about the data. We'll actually engage you in telling some stories, those chairs sitting in the back of the room. You'll be in them soon, and you'll have an opportunity to share your own stories, to move around a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about what is it that you are taking away? What are you learning? What would you like to do next with what you're, what you're hearing um, and the story that you're telling? So that's enough introduction for the day. We will have a break at 9 o'clock. We'll be in here till about 10, and we'll have a break at 9 o'clock. Kim, Kim Simmons is our partner here at the library and has been the coordinator for Choose Civility. And she does much more in our community than that, but um, we'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Thank Thank you. Dan. So welcome to our Portland Public Conversation Series. If you haven't already marked your calendars, our second in the series is November 25th, and our third is on December 9th. So we hope that you'll come back and from a friend. Um, I'm grateful to our grand partners, Lift 360 and the Maine Humanities Council, um, who will, will be offering some neighborhood programming this fall as well, and we have a handout for you at the end about that. And to the Lerner Foundation, whose support makes it possible for us to be exploring these issues um, and trying a bunch of different kinds of programs. Um, so we really appreciate their support. And I'm really grateful to all the people who attended programs over the last year, we began last September with a program on incivility in politics with Professor Dan Che. And we've had a lot of different um, kinds of events along the way. We really appreciate your feedback as people come forward as potential partners and collaborators and risk taking part in programs that they might not be familiar with or know, um, know what to expect. One of those programs came to our city of leaders um, team on a book called Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty, and people really asked for more conversation. So in partnership with the League of Women Voters and um, USM's Economics Department and the Maine Center for Economic Policy, we'll be showing the film Inequality for All on October 29th at 6 p.m. So mark your calendars for that one, too. We are um, so clear here at the library that civility does not require a suppression of dissent or emotion. Both those things, debate and even very heated debate, are central to democracy. But what we hope to move forward is the opportunity for more people to participate in the conversations that are central to our shared well-being. For some of us, more participation means more listening. And for others of us, more participation means taking a risk telling our story, sharing our opinion, even if it might not be popular. We want to build that trust that the stories and ideas that you share here will be received with respect. When I think about the formation of our civil society, I personally often think about protest culture. I'm a sociologist by training, and I love social movements. But I have a growing awareness that it's patient, sustained dialogue and discussion that's going to move us um, towards creating a, a one city and a common good that we're all um, going to be able to participate in. 
We're gathering for these Portland public conversations not to try to reach consensus on significant issues facing our, our communities and not to make policy recommendations at this time, but instead really to just begin to explore the opportunities and challenges that await us if we begin to create connections across our differences, to test our abilities to listen as an ally, and to articulate our own point of view. We are the library, a place where stories abound, and the opportunity to sift through credible information is available. We welcome your participation and your feedback in the end. And so with that, I want to welcome Amanda Rector, who is our state economist, and she also serves as the governor's liaison to the U.S. Census Bureau. She's a true um, data, uh, data person and help understand um, the big numbers and what they might mean to us. We invited her here because we want to start with a shared, um, a common understanding about who we are as Portland City, who we are big picture, which might not be reflected in our, in our daily walks, in our jobs, in our, in our um, neighborhoods and then to move into what that means to us. So Amanda, I welcome you. Um, share the name. Well, good morning. I'm very happy to be here. I'm always happy to talk about demographics, one of my favorite topics. Uh, anytime anybody invites me to go and speak about some of the places people, I get really excited. Uh, data nerd, totally acceptable title for me. I, I fully embrace that. I do want to start with the really boring stuff, which is where is this data coming from? Uh, as was mentioned, I am the governor's liaison to the Census Bureau. I also serve as the lead for a program called the State Data Center, which is a partnership between the Census Bureau and all the different states helping to disseminate data. The Portland Public Library is one of the affiliates. We have affiliates all across the state. So Census Bureau data is near and dear to my heart in many respects. For this, you're getting some freshly released data, just a couple weeks old, the 2013 One Year American Community Survey. That's an ongoing survey that the Census Bureau does. They release new data every year. Um, this replaced the long form of the decennial census. So they have all sorts of detailed demographic and social and economic data in there. I have a link there. If you are interested in learning more about it, you can go to the Census Bureau's website and find out more. <coughs> also, because I am a data nerd, I want to talk about margins of error because the S American Community Survey is sample-based. There are margins of error around all of the data that I'm going to talk about. Um, I haven't included them in my charts. Normally I try to include the margins of error just so people keep it in mind that it's not, even though it sounds like a very precise number, it's not all that precise. But I have really focused on differences that are statistically significant. So when I'm comparing Maine to Portland, I've really focused in on areas where Portland and Maine are actually different. So I'm here to sort of set the stage and give you the data background that describes Portland. What does it really mean when we say Portland's the big city here in Maine? First, I want to talk about demographics. Uh, we can all pause for a moment. That's my son. He's really adorable. Uh, <laughs> take a moment to just appreciate that. So I'm going to talk about demographics first, sort of the basic age, race, uh, place of birth. I'm going to talk about some economic characteristics. Where are people working? What are their incomes? What types of jobs are in the city? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some housing data in terms of where are people living? Uh, are they renting or owning? So, on to the data. Demographics. We all know Portland is Maine's most populous city. That is definitely something to celebrate. Hooray for Portland. Uh, the total population in Maine, a little over 1.3 million. We're a small state. Cumberland County has about 20% oh, of the statewide population, and Portland has about a quarter of the population in Cumberland County. So you've got about 5% of the state's total population right here in Portland. That's pretty good. We talk a lot about how Maine is the oldest state in the country. That's looking at median age. Uh, is Portland younger than the state as a whole? Oh yes, yes you are. The median age for Maine is about 44 years. Cumberland County is a little bit younger with a median age of 42. Portland is under 36 years. So you're, you're quite a bit younger than the state as a whole. That means that you have this young mobile population. 
not that kind of mobile. I'm talking more geographic mobility, so moving around. That's because if you look at the age groups that you have, your median age is brought down because you have a lot of young people. You've got way more 20 to 24 year olds and 25 to 34 year olds than the state as a whole. Uh, if you look at this, Maine's got about, oh, 17% of the population in those two age cohorts, so between 20 and 34 years. And you've got almost 30% of your population in Portland in those two age groups. And on the other end of the spectrum, the 65 to 74 year olds, about 10% of Maine's population is in that age cohort, uh, only about 5.6% of Portland's population. So you have a much younger population as a whole. Of course, not only are they younger, they are also, in general, uh, not married. So you've got a much smaller proportion of family households here in Portland. Both Maine and Cumberland County are right around 62% of households are family households. It's less than 50% of the households here in Portland are family households. And about 38% are a householder living alone. And of those householders living alone, most of them are people who are never married. In fact, 53% uh, are males never married and 42% females never married. That's considerably higher than the state and Cumberland County figures if you look at that. And of course, if you're not married, it's much easier to move around from one state to another year after year. So if you look at the residents where people were living a year ago in Maine, about 86% of the population was living in the same house a year ago that they were living in at the time of the survey. Uh, only about 72% of Portland's residents were living in the same house, and 7% of Portland's residents were living in a different state entirely a year ago. That's a pretty good movement. There's a lot of geographic churn going on here. Of course, Portland is more racially diverse than the state as a whole. Uh, Maine is one of the whitest states in the country. We uh, fight it out with Vermont over who has the title. We sort of go back and forth year to year. About 95% of Maine's population is white. Uh, only about 84% of po Portland's population is white, though. So there is more uh, racial diversity here in Portland, mostly coming from black or African American and Asian populations. Those are both higher rates uh, in the population in Portland than for the state as a whole. Ancestry, I thought this was kind of funny. So we all know Maine has a, a large percentage of the population with French ancestry, about 16%. Only about 8% of Portland's population has French ancestry. But I had no idea almost 10% of Portland's uh, population has Italian ancestry. It's a new statistic for me when I was going through this data. And of course, Portland has a much larger percentage of the population with uh, ancestry from Sub-Saharan Africa. One of the things that makes Portland's racial diversity interesting is that it's mostly coming from a foreign-born population, so coming from immigrants to the area rather than a native-born population. So the native-born, of course, is still very high, but you can see Maine is around 97%, Portland's around 85%, foreign-born 15%, considerably higher than Maine's overall foreign-born population of about 3.4%. That can lead to a lot of challenges. Um, certainly, one of the challenges is the fact that Portland has a larger percentage of the population who speak a language other than English at home and speak English less than very well, a little over 7%. Uh, that can make it challenging in schools, in doctor's offices, businesses, um, and for workers. So let's switch gears now, talk about employment and workers. So let's talk first what types of jobs people in Portland have. This is occupations. You have more people in management, business, science, and arts than the state as a whole. You've got fewer people in natural resources, construction, maintenance, and production, transportation, and material moving. I've got a chart. There's a lot going on here, so I just want to highlight those pieces first. The very first set of columns here, all the way to the left, are the management, business, science, and arts. And you can see Portland and Cumberland County both are considerably higher than the state in terms of the percent of employment in those occupations. And then, as you would expect, there are fewer of the sort of natural resources, construction, production types of jobs in the, the more urban areas compared to the more rural parts of the state. 
So that's what people do. What about the businesses? What are the industries? Well, you have more arts, entertainment, and recreation, and accommodation and food services. Not terribly surprising to anybody who actually walks around in Portland and looks at the very large number of restaurants, art galleries, uh, entertainment facilities. There's a lot going on down here. It's definitely a cultural center of sorts. Uh, and you've got fewer construction and manufacturing jobs. And there's even more going on in this chart, and I'm not going to go through most of it. I do want to highlight a couple of things. Way over on the left, that first set of columns there are agriculture, forestry, fishing, hunting, and mining. Not a big industry in the state as a whole. Uh, you have basically none in Portland. <laughs> Uh, very, very small share here. You can see their, their larger shares statewide in construction and manufacturing, but fewer in Portland uh, and Cumberland County. Everybody's at about the same level for retail trade. The really tall section in there, uh, that's education services and healthcare. Remember we talked about old state? Healthcare is a really big industry in Maine. And everybody's at about the same level there. And then the next set of bars over from that are arts, entertainment, recreation, and accommodation food services. And you can see just how much higher a percentage of jobs are in that industry in Portland compared to Maine. Commuting. Uh, Portland is like a city in that people walk to work. Uh, we don't have the robust public transportation system that a big city like D.C. or even Boston has, but certainly there's more walking to work and you've got a shorter commute time. So if you look at the rates of driving alone, it's about 77% statewide. Uh, people just commute in their little cars on the highway. In Portland, it's lower. It's about 63%. But your percentage of people walking to work is about 13%, quite a bit higher. And the travel time, as I said, is lower. It's about 23 minutes statewide. It's about 18 minutes here in Portland. So you don't take as long to get where you're going. My commute time zone is 40 minutes. So 18 minutes sounds pretty good to me. Let's talk about income and benefits. So one of the things to keep in mind is that this is residence-based. So for people living in Portland, Incomes are about the same as the statewide average, but incomes for people living in Cumberland County are higher than Maine or Portland, the city itself. This is all in 2013 dollars. The first set of columns are median household income. You can see Cumberland County is higher than Maine. Maine is actually higher than Portland in terms of median household income. Remember that one of the very first slides I showed that was household formation, you've got more non-family households relative to the statewide percentage. So median family income is considerably higher than non-family income. You've got more of those non-family incomes and fewer of the family incomes, which is bringing your overall household income down. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as we all know, median earnings for men are <coughs> higher than median earnings for women. I, the, the margins of error are really big on the Portland data, so it's hard to figure out exactly what the uh, percentages are. They're um, just too large to be able to get a good statistic in terms of the percentage. But I wanted to include those in there just so you could see. Of course, the fact that you have a younger population means you have fewer people who are on Social Security and re receiving retirement income. But because you have those lower incomes, it also means you have more people receiving welfare benefits and higher rates of poverty. That's all typical of cities in general. So let's look at the percentages here. A third of Maine's population receives Social Security. Only about a quarter of Portland's population receives Social Security. And while 20% of the state and Cumberland County receive retirement income, only about 11% of Portland's population receives retirement income. Cash public assistance income, however, is higher in Portland, about 8% compared to a little over 4%. And then receipt of food stamps and SNAP benefits in the past year, um, about a quarter of Portland's population compared to about 18% statewide. So that's a bit higher here. Cumberland County is, is lower than either of those. Keep in mind, 
Cumberland County also had that high, much higher income level. And poverty rates are higher here, uh, about 10% statewide, about 18% of families were in poverty uh, in Portland, and in terms of actual people, about 14% statewide and 23% in Portland. So let's do just a quick rundown through some housing statistics. We think about cities, we think about apartments. Uh, just along those same lines, Portland has more rental housing. Uh, in terms of Maine, about 70% is owner-occupied, 30% is renter-occupied. Portland, you've got about 40% owner-occupied and 60% renter-occupied. So it's much more of the renter market as opposed to an ownership uh, market here. Vacancy rates are lower in Portland, uh, both for owners and renters though, and rents are higher here. No surprise to anyone, I don't think. Your homeowner vacancy rate is zero. So what houses you do have are occupied, and your rental vacancy rate is 4.2%, so that's still very low, and quite a bit lower than the state or Cumberland County. Rent is sort of interesting. Statewide, that's the, the blue line in here. The peak is uh, in the $500 to $750 range, and then there's sort of another large group at the $750 to $1,000. A little bit less than 1000 to 1500 and then it drops off when you hit the $1,500 uh, rate. Portland and Cumberland County, though, <laughs> you, you've got a big spike up around 750 to 1000 another big group in the 1000 to 1500 and then you've got over 10% of your occupied units paying rent or paying $1,500 or more uh, a month. That's, that's pretty significant. So just to try to sum all this up, you know, we talk about Portland as the big city for Maine, and it really is very much a city. It has a lot of the same characteristics that other large urban areas have. And so even though it's part of Maine, and so we do have, compared to major metropolitan areas, an older population, uh, less racial diversity, compared to the rest of Maine, you do have the younger population, more racial diversity and a lot of the same characteristics as other urban areas. Population, as I just said, it's younger, it's more diverse, it's more mobile, you're able to move around more freely than, than uh, the statewide population. Incomes are lower, poverty is higher, but Portland is a desirable place to live. I mean, look at those rents and the vacancy rates. People want to be here, and it, it does have a very active economy. This is where a lot of the economic growth for the state is, and so it is a desirable place to locate. I just blew through a lot of data, <laughs> so there may very well be questions that, that folks have about either the data that I have included or data that I haven't included. So here's my contact information. Uh, there's a, a website for our office. We do have a lot of data on our website. And then my phone number and email are on there as well. And I will hopefully be here through the rest of the morning. So if you have questions afterwards, please feel free to come up and find me after. Thank you very much. Clarifying questions. We have time for maybe two questions, and I saw a hand up here and here. But just clarifying questions, if we could, for now before we go into the next stage. Who was? You want to go first? Do you, uh, in your statistics, do you differentiate between African Americans and Africans? Because there are people. I mean, who right, right. Those two terms are very different. So the the Census Bureau data you would be able to look at uh, some more detailed ancestry versus place of birth and race categories. The problem with the one-year data is that the sample size is very, very small. There are three-year and five-year aggregate data sets that they produce that will be released later on that give you a much larger sample and so you can access some of the data that's not available at the one-year level just because the population is approximately too small, they have certain thresholds that they have to do before they can release the data. So that is something that would be available in probably, you probably have to look at the five-year data, but you certainly could 
get at that particular fine grain. And wherever we find data and some of the other work we've done, that's been a really difficult point to differentiate. Thank you. Yeah, my question is to clarify. I was just working with the HUD area median income data, 80%. 50% of median and so forth. And I, I like to work with household. And it's like real clearly in my mind at the court, I was dealing with a number of $46,000. And I'm trying to figure out the $40,000 for also for household. I think the HUD, though, that may be a figure for a household of four, but it's their dominant number on the HUD chart is $46,000. So I know that the, the HUD data is a little bit different. It may be from an older data set. This is from data that was just released a couple of weeks ago. And so it, it could be that it was from a previous year. I'm not familiar with exactly year, where we have that big a discrepancy. It, it could, actually. Oh. Because the, the sample size is so small, if you're looking at the single year data, it can bounce around a lot. I'm, I'm not familiar with the HUD data as much as I am with the census, so I'd have to look at exactly what their data source is. Yeah, it isn't so much I'm questioning it, I'm just trying to figure out, working on some housing stuff, Yeah. which figure. I'm just trying to learn, so. Sure, right? yeah. It's just saying. And that's a, that's a challenge that everybody faces, is that all of these different uh, programs are using their own particular definitions and, and data sources. And that's something that I struggle with. I, I get a lot of calls from people who are looking for a figure for a grant and they can't quite figure out which data source they're supposed to be looking at. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Is this data surprising to folks at all? Any kind of quick comments? What does it mean? What does data mean for us here in Portland? It's, I mean, it struck me that there was a huge concentration of wealth and poverty in the bit, and maybe that means the middle is small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't bring um, a breakout of income brackets, but that is available, so you can look at, they sort of break the income out by certain levels, and so you could look at how many people you have at the low income versus the high income. And, and I haven't looked at that in this data set, but I suspect you're probably right that you do have this sort of divergent where you have more of the low income, more of the high income, and not a lot in, in between. Thank you. And we'll continue. One last question. Well, it wasn't really a question. You yes. sort of had, I thought you would ask a question. Yes, go ahead. And so, you know, I just wanted to say, I think data is power because increasingly we're entering an era where people don't just think they're entitled to their own opinions, they think they're entitled to their own facts, you can point it back and see how that's very powerful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We're going to end on that comment. <laughs> transition to the next piece. We'll have more time to talk about this. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and transition. Laura Moorhead, my colleague from Lit360, will uh, be introducing our next speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see all your faces, some familiar and some new. And we're so glad that you're here this morning. The next speaker will add a new dimension to the data you've already heard. This is Lisa Sockabason, who's with the Office of Health Equity at the state level. Lisa, come on up here, Lisa. I won't, I won't give your whole history because I think that's for you to say if you'd like to, but I think the most important thing for me about today, when I think about Lisa being here today, is that she is um, able to bring alive some of the stories of Mainers. And that's what we wanted to do today, was to have you think about what story you would tell about who you are, some aspect of your identity. And we'll be getting into that in a, a little later when we get into small groups. But for now, Lisa's setting the stage for you to understand the stories of a few Mainers who are real people, who have stories to tell, who have multiple facets to their identity and to their identities. And that's a, a wonderful stage setter for you to think about what's important about your identities as someone who lives in the Portland area, someone who is a Mainer who has a story to tell. So I want to introduce you to my colleague, my friend, someone I've worked with a lot through, through our leadership intensive and through our health leadership development programs. Um, 
we do have yeah. so much value. So I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. And I have some um, folks that are going to be readers for us. So in just a couple minutes, I'll have you come and find your person that you're going to be reflecting today. So uh, just a brief background on myself. I direct the Office of Health Equity for the state of Maine, um, where we address issues of disparities, focused primarily around health and health disparities. Um, originally, I'm a Passamaquoddy tribal member. I'm from Indian Township, a small Passamaquoddy reservation, very far from Portland. Um, and, and now I live in the southern part of the state. So this was a project that some of my colleagues and myself embarked on. And what we wanted, what we wanted to understand was um, the issue that Amanda brought up in terms of the whitest state in the nation. And, and as she said, we fight, and I don't even like to use that term, fight for that distinction, but oftentimes we go back and forth with Vermont. And one of my colleagues who is not from Maine and from a very diverse um, place herself said, why are we not able to attract diversity? We're seeing changes in, in the diversity of the state of Maine, but why, are we, why do we not see more racial and ethnic diversity? And it was strange to her coming from a very um, diverse, racially diverse state um, and coming to Maine and really seeing how um, it, it took her a while to see um, a face that did not look like hers. And she is, she's white from, from New Jersey. And so what we wanted to do was understand from different faces of Maine that we often don't hear from. And we wanted to hear about their experiences in Maine and share with us what a day is like for them. And some of these people represent one individual that really told us a compelling story and that we wanted to reflect their story. But most of these people are groups of people where we were able to pull out themes. We were able to hear from a group of refugee women and hear similar stories in every single one of their voices. And what was so, you know, Laura talked about us telling our stories and how we are unique. What I wanted to bring to all of you were stories that I have a feeling even if you look different than most of the folks in front of us, you are going to have so many similarities with people. So we often talk about difference. I really want to talk about how we are the same and how we can be united on some of those commonalities in our stories. So for the people that are readers, could you come up and stand by, by your um, poster? Do we have anybody in the audience that speaks even a little bit of French? Just a little. Will you be a reader? Do you know? You do? Oh, but there's a word. I don't know if French. I just don't know. Okay, so um, I think you are Sylvia. Do you mind you um, being Yvonne instead? That would be great. And where is Yvonne? I'm looking for Yvonne. Um, Okay, perfect. I was telling Laura um, and Amanda that there has never been a time where I haven't been able to find a French speaker. So um, thank you very much. And then Amanda was sharing with me the data that French ancestry is half in Portland than it is the rest of the state. So I started getting nervous. So these two ladies, thank you. And so if you do not mind coming up, and we can spread these out a little bit further so people have time to, or room to stand. Sure. So what I want you to think about is which one of these stories, regardless of gender, race, language, can you relate to? And we're going to have a conversation about them when we are done. So you, behind, does that work for you guys? OK, great. Perfect, and I will help, um, what I will do is just have you pass the, the mic down. So, Sylvia. Perfect. Great. Um, my name is Sylvia. I am a Native American living in Calais, Maine. I feel the medical staff at the local hospital and physician offices have profiled Native Americans as drug seekers. 
I had to have an orth I had to have orthopedic surgery to repair my knee that I injured playing in a charity softball game. My recovery has been long and painful. In describing my pain to the doctor, he immediately said he would not give me nar narcotics for my pain and that he would need me to submit a urine test before he prescribed any treatment. All I wanted was a plan to get better, not to be accused of seeking drugs. During my visit, my doctor also asked me what percent Indian I was. Why do people ask me that? We don't ask other races what percent they are. I responded to my doctor by asking him what percent white he was. <laughs> Several years ago, when I was at high a high school football game, I saw a student from opposing team whose ma mascot was Redskins portray a warring Indian prancing about, doing war whoops, mocking sacred symbols and sacred dances. I asked my mother why our culture has been shown so much disrespect. She had tears in her eyes and both of us decided to leave together. These mascots and their performances, logos, or names are disrespectful and offensive to Native Americans and others who are offended by stereotyping. Can you imagine a team named the White Skins, the Black Skins, or the Yellow Skins? It would never be allowed. After many meetings with the, social, the school board, one of my proudest accomplishments was when we were successful in changing the mascot of the team from the Redskins to the Red Storms. My name is Sylvia, and I am a force in Maine. You can tell which category I fit into in the census data. <laughs> My name is Pedro. I live in Bangor, Maine with my wife, Jill. We are expecting our second child in three months. I moved here from Puerto Rico when I was 18 to attend the University of Maine in Orono. Folks in Maine are pretty enlightened and tolerant, but they have few experiences dealing with people of color, so they rely on stereotypes. I think they are much more inclined to think the worst. My wife struggles with how I'm treated differently and how people look at us when we are together. We were shopping recently and a woman was staring at us. When we looked back at her, she shook her head in disgust and walked away. Five years ago, I had a job where racial discrimination was a routine occurrence. My supervisor constantly questioned me about phone bills accusing me of making personal long-distance calls. I was also accused twice of stealing money from the company safe. My supervisor told me, you people are used to doing stuff like this. When I asked him, what do you mean, you people? He said, you know what I mean. When I went to my supervisor's boss about the harassment, I was told that the company was not going to address my concerns because the company was going out of business. I filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission and they agreed that I had been treated unfairly because of my race. Now what? My name is Pedro and I am a face of Maine. Hello, my name is Gloria. I live in Bitterford, Maine with my husband of 48 years. We moved from Japan to Maine in 1970 for my husband's job. Shortly after arriving in Maine, I landed a job with a local company where I worked for the next 22 years. I had an excellent work record and had been named top nationwide manager three times, but my evaluations dropped to unsatisfactory soon after I had the company investigate my supervisor who called me a derogatory name. The company ordered my boss to apologize, but allowed him to continue supervising me. Four months later, that same supervisor recommended that I be fired. My company was focused on sexual harassment training, but did little on diversity training. Employers seemed to be reluctant to suspend or fire a worker who makes racial slurs, yet that same employee would likely lose his job if he made sexual comments to a female coworker. It is amazing the number of times that people will speak very loudly and slowly to me assuming I cannot speak the language. I usually just smile and respond in a slow, loud voice. 
<laughs> Some people will just be rude and talk about you while you are still in the room. They assume you don't understand English. It's frustrating to me because my first job was teaching English in my home country. It is hurtful that some people are so disrespectful to anyone that looks different from them. My name is Gloria, and I am a face of Maine. Hello, my name is Aurala. I'm 25 years old. I have four children and a wonderful husband. We moved to Lewiston, Maine in 1999 from Somalia to find a better life for our family. I'm fluent in both the languages of Somali and English. It's been a challenge to keep my children speaking Somali. They mostly speak English. A friend called me one day and my daughter answered the phone in English and my friend spoke to her in Somali. My daughter never said a word. She put down the phone and yelled to me that someone was speaking Somali. Oftentimes, I feel sad that my children do not speak our native language. Recently, my son was in a fight at school and I was called in to come get him. I arrived at school to have the principal tell me that my son was suspended for three days. The other boy in the fight was white and was still sitting in his office waiting for his parents. I asked if he would be suspended as well and the principal assured me that he would be. I found out later that week that the other boy was allowed to go back to class and was not suspended. The racial climate in Lewiston is one that on the surface seems all right, but when an incident happens where it involves someone of color, the tension seems to surface rather quickly. My name is Arala, and I am a face of Maine. My name is Stephen. I am 27 years old, and I live in Portland, Maine. My family moved here from New York when I was seven. I applied for a manufacturing job in South Portland several years ago, in which I was the only black person among 12 candidates that applied for the job. I was told by the company that I didn't do well on the test and I didn't have manufacturing experience. Instead, they hired five white candidates. One of them also had difficulty with the math test, and four others didn't have any manufacturing experience. I learned later that of all the employees at the company, none are black. This is not the only thing that makes me know that racism exists here in Maine. My younger brother was riding a late bus home after school when three, other, three older bullies started harassing him at the back of the bus. They start by telling some offensive racial jokes, but then lead to a barrage of racial slurs. One bully dropped reference to the Ku Klux Klan and Kunta Kinte, referring to the slave depicted in the television miniseries Roots. As the scene progressed, one of the older boys spat on my brother and hit him in the head. This is not an incident that happened 40 years ago in, in the South. This happened right here in Maine just two years ago. My name is Stephen, and I am a face of Maine. Bonjour, je m'appelle Yvonne. My name is Yvonne and I come from Waterville. When I was young, we spoke French at home with Mama and Papa, but if I spoke French at school, I was teased by other kids. When I had my own children, I didn't want them to have that experience so that all speak good English. We thought we were making life better for them, but now that my kids are grown, they wish they could speak French. My grandson, Marcus, goes to l'Ecole Francaise du Maine in Freeport. Many students have Franco-American parents who lost their French language. My son wanted his son to learn more about our heritage and background. I am so happy that I can speak French with Marcus. I only regret that I did not make sure my own children knew their French. We Franco-Americans have a saying, qui perd sa langue perd sa foi. Who loses her language loses her faith. When the first French Canadians came to live in Maine, we were discriminated against because we spoke French. We were Catholic, and we had our own ways of doing things. I remember Papa telling stories about those times. Did you know that in the 1920s, Maine had more members in the Ku Klux Klan than any state in the country? The goal of the Klan was to wipe out the French Canadian Catholics and the Native Americans in Maine. But we're still here, and now there is a renewed interest in telling our stories and recovering our language and culture. 
I would like to share something from the book Wednesday's Child by Ray Cote Robbins. It really tells how I feel about my past and my hope for the future. I make bold the colors in my house. I get dizzy admiring the roofs in Quebec. The colors on the houses leave me breathless. I have been shamed to white, but I vow to return to the palette of true colors. I dream the visions of young women in French. The cookbook of life rendered for what it is, that which sustains the generations to come. Pride, not shame, in the female cook pot. Modern day tapestry of living, unparalleled in its boasts. On parle français ici, the commercial advertisements read. Understood at last. My name is Yvonne, et je suis le visage du Maine. to facilitate a conversation with everybody here and we want to talk about what did you find similar in each of these stories even though they're all very different um, could you relate to any one of these stories even if you come from a different background so general thoughts and impressions Please. Well, most, if not all, were um, subjected to stereotypes, being stereotyped. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And who hasn't that happened to? Right? We can all relate to that. Yes, please. Some threads of loss of identity. Yeah, loss of identity and loss of language mm -hmm. was really a thread that we heard a lot, pretty much in almost every story, every group of people that we talk to. Yes? It sounded like um, all of them had really experienced instability in a very direct and personal way. Mm. Did everyone hear that? No. Everyone um, had experienced incivility <coughs> in some way, whether direct or indirect. Yes? There seemed to be a lack of people interested in learning of these folks' own culture. Uh, it strikes me as sad. That, I'm sorry, I didn't get what you said. It strikes me as sad that, yeah. uh, that there was no element of that at all. Yeah, absolutely. Right here, and then we'll go in front here. Well, at the end of that, it seems like the people that they cite who are rude to them or really distrustful are afraid. It feels to me that it's not just incivil, but there's fear behind finding out more about who these people might really be. That is a really good point. And I think every story, there was a story of fear. And fear not being separate from them on a daily basis. Always being on guard is what we would hear. That means fearful, but I mean the people who are treating them badly are coming from a place of fear. Of fear. Also. Absolutely. Yeah. Right here. It's just a minute to be important when you say stereotype, even negative stereotypes. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's nothing positive about the stereotype. Right. Which I think many people think that um, the connotation of stereotype is not but I mean I think we get to be important. Absolutely. Negative stereotyping is what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Right here, and then we'll go in the back. Although the prejudice exhibited was systemic. The voice was that of people who felt alone and personally attacked as an individual, not as part of a community that was supporting them. Absolutely, and uh, the element of fear came up a lot. A lot of um, discussion about isolation and, and feeling alone um, and worrying about even when family comes to visit or moving family into the state that feeling of isolation they feel, they do not want others to feel. And so that was something that we had long conversations about, is isolation. Just kind of a general observation, and it is my own story. I grew up as a child with blacks and human and other types of races and whatnot. 
and usual travel experiences and whatnot. So the idea of separation really wasn't there. As we grew older, of course, we get hearing about these kinds of things. And we start looking at each other and say, these people are up to lunch. All I'm bringing up here is the impact of childhood bias and the positive aspects when it's not there. Mm -hmm. Conditioning causes a lot of damage. At a very young age, absolutely. Yeah, in most of these scenarios where there was a difficult encounter, there was also a power imbalance between the people in the, in the conversation. And that plays into the force that negative stereotyping can have um, for the people who are on the lower end of that power. That's a great point, how power comes to play in each one of these stories. Absolutely. And something I got from all of them, well, not all of them, many were talking about um, an institution like school or um, a hospital or mm -hmm. work. And I think we're a land of laws, and we all kind of assume <coughs> that we, as, as a nation, have certain protections. Mm -hmm. And I just, for me, I heard that um, maybe that's not all happening. Right. But when we that. talk about different levels, of discrimination or racism, that institutional um, and structural is sometimes a lot more overwhelming and you feel that powerlessness in every place that you may enter, not just on a one-on-one -on -one encounter. And that our laws are there. How are they enforced? How are they, how are we living our code? Right. right. You've also brought up something about um, you know, they're in place, so oftentimes people are surprised to hear some of these things and that they still go on. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to hear from people that every single one of these people or groups of people, um, this was a part of their daily life. This feeling of fear or being on guard or thinking like they're being treated differently because of, because oftentimes we'll hear from particularly Pedro where he was in the store and this woman looked at him and his wife and shook, shook the head, do you remember, and walked away. And he is basically saying, you know, feeling like it was because of his race. And um, oftentimes we'll get pushed back and say, you know, it may not have anything to do with his race. Maybe that person was thinking about something and didn't even see him. And I think the point is, but the feeling of always having, having to ask the question, Am I being treated this way because I am, you name the race? Um, and I think that's the point, is always having to have that thought process. Way back here. One thing for the purposes of our project that, that struck me is how challenging it is when there's these long histories of discrimination and oppression and hurt and, and incivility to figure out how to start. And so when people mm -hmm. express curiosity you know, about somebody's heritage, it can come out really wrong and end up feeling like, why are you asking me what percentage I am? Right. You know, that wasn't friendly. But when, when you don't have curiosity, why are, don't you want to know about my history? That's, you know, so right. I think there are really challenging community norms about how do we be curious about each other's stories without over ascribing people to their group or making assumptions about them. And, and when do we decide to share our curiosity? In groups like this, wonderful, we can have those conversations. It is wonderful that there are spaces so we can have a safe dialogue and we can share that curiosity. The time not to share curiosity probably is when you're in the doctor's office and the doctor's asking you questions like that. <laughs> So when do we have, and do we set up safe places to have these conversations in educational settings, in you know hospitals, and also in forums like this? Is there really any guidelines for civil discourse in you know so that people aren't too closed off and not crossing boundaries that actually are microaggressions accidentally? Sure. Right here, and then I think we're going to break. I'm going to take two more. Okay. Yes, you haven't spoken yet, so can I just... He, he had his hand up first. Okay. As someone who grew up in a society where racism and homophobia were normative, 
what's striking to me is how seldom I've heard these stories told as directly. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these folks that you see before you were people that we had built trust and had, you know, a long, um, a long relationship. And so I think that did change what they would share. And um, it also made them somewhat anonymous, you know, with names changing and pulling common themes out of groups of stories. But I think that's a great point. Oftentimes, it is not that direct. I, for many, many years, professionally and personally, I find it very challenging to go about my life and my day and my interests and so forth, and how much to see people that are different, and how much to not see that they're different. I find, I don't have any, I, it's, it, it's a live struggle for me, mm -hmm. because, well, I, I did not does not my experience of that at the moment, but I mean, I've been in places, and I don't think it's right to always notice, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's, wrong, right, to never notice. <laughs> but I get uncomfortable with people that notice too much. Certainly. And if I ask you a nosy a question, because I'm delighted and curious, especially with somebody from Mexico, they don't live it, you know, and they don't want me to say, you know, they don't, they're offended, and here I am being delighted, wanting to share. Right. It's, it's, it's ongoing. <laughs> It goes back to the fear aspect, right? There's fear on both sides. There's discomfort on both sides. So how do we strike that balance and have conversations? One more, and then Laura's going to give us the hook. I was just going to say, I think it's really important to recognize socialization that happens. And like, we are a group of, I'm guessing, almost entirely white folks, you know, having a discussion about this. And we need to acknowledge the fact that people of color often feel very tokenized. Um, and so I think the important thing to ask is questions and recognize that people are curious, but that it often is happening in a place where a white person is tokenizing a person of color to understand their culture or, um, yeah, and that's something that's very real and um, very common now in our society. Absolutely. I was just going to say, maybe if we were like the lady here, and I had the same thought, often, I know for myself, with this curiosity, I'm interested. Mm -hmm. and so maybe you just say, I'm asking you this not to make a judgment, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, sure. Some way to just practice that. Absolutely. And, and sometimes you, you need to build that relationship a little bit before you die. <coughs> so I think we're going to... Do you want to transition us to the next? Great. Thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate this process. So we're going to take a five minute break in just a moment, but I want to finish this part of the agenda with the data and the posters with a reading because that's what we do at Lyft 360. <laughs> And it's what we do at the library as well. This is a Margaret Wheatley reading that I think pertains so beautifully to what all of you have said as you talked about what you heard here. It's called Turning to One Another. There's no greater power than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible, not what's wrong, and keep asking. Notice what you care about, and boy, do I need my glasses. There we go. Oh, so much clearer. Notice what you care about. Assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. There you are with, those, with your comments. Talk to people you know. Talk to people you don't know. Talk to people you never talk to. Be intrigued by the differences you hear. Expect to be surprised. Treasure curiosity more than certainty. Invite in everybody who cares to work on what's possible. Acknowledge that everyone is an expert in something. Know that creative solutions come from new connections. Remember, you don't fear people whose story you know. 
Real listening always brings people closer together. Trust that meaningful conversations can change your world. Rely on human goodness. Stay together.